Now we're going to get this thing going. I would like to introduce Mr. Krishna Wavilala, who is the founder of our organization. Uh, Mr. Wavilala has been a long-time Houstonian for the past 36 years, who made a difference to the community by undertaking legacy projects such as the Mahatma Gandhi Statue Project in Herman Park, India Studies Program at the University of Houston, and launching of the Indo-American Oral History Project. He has also held various leadership positions in several community organizations like the India Culture Center, India House, of course, American Society of Indian Engineers, and the Telugu Cultural Association of Houston and New York. He has been profiled by Houston Chronicle and various TV networks like ABC Channel 13, Fox TV Channel 26, and HCC TV Network. Please welcome Mr. Krishna Wavilala, founder and chairman of Foundations of India Study. Thank you, Vishal. Actually, when you described me in such a high glorified manner, really I am not all that great. Let me tell you that. In reality, I am a normal person um, trying to do some social service in Houston for the past uh, 35 years. And I have got very many good friends in the community who support my activities, particularly the Foundation for India Studies. Presently, I'm the chairman, and I'm trying to pass on the baton to young people <laughs> like Babu or somebody, you know, like Vishal, and I'm waiting for that day to come. And um, I welcome you all, and you have been a uh, patient crowd and uh, pa very patient full to wait for a few extra minutes until uh, Babu's uh, link, you know, is being, his speech will be uh, televised and uh, I think it is called stream, uh, live streamed to YouTube um, and also to his Facebook account, etc. So we are looking forward for um, his uh, thought-provoking speech. And uh, one thing I want to tell, uh, the Foundation for India Studies was formed to present uh, free ideas on a platform. We are open for discussion for either side of the issues. We are mostly project-based uh, organization. We also uh, launched an Indo-American oral history project which is going on for the last five years and we have interviewed more than 50 uh, senior citizens of the Indian community who migrated to this country some years ago and we are recording their experiences on um, on, la on, the t uh, on the video and that is transcribed uh, and then uh, digitized and uploaded to the Houston Public Library's archives. So we have done so far uh, more than 50 uh, interviews and we are asking our community to come forward to give their life stories and record them. And um, now I'm very uh, happy to uh, announced that we have a strong group for presentation from the Humanists of Houston, which is an organization which has been there for several years, but I myself did not know until <laughs> Sir Babu Gogreni was coming. And then I searched in the internet and I found that uh, there is a strange group of uh, free thinkers and rationalists and humanists, so you, you know, everybody who has an idea, okay. And they are, they are, uh, I attended their uh, lecture and uh, their uh, meetings. And also yesterday they gave a nice uh, welcome party to Mr. Babu Gogineni yesterday. And um, I, I don't want to stand in between you and Mr. Gogineni for long. Um, so I would welcome Mr. Babu Gogineni. Little bit of snafu here. I'll give a brief introduction for Mr. Gogineni real quick so everybody in the room knows a little bit about him. Thank you, sir. Now it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker today, Mr. Babu Gogineni. He is an Indian humanist rationalist 
and human rights activist who served as the executive director of the International Humanist and Ethical Union, which is also abbreviated as IHEU. He is well-known humanist around the world. He is the founder of South Asian Humanist Association and Indian Humanist. He is also the founder and owner of Skill Guru, a training organization and a private business. In his activism, he campaigns against established privilege and abuse of rights done in the name of religion. During his time with the IHEU, he led their worldwide campaign for the protection of Bangladeshi writer Taslima Nasreen, bringing Pakistani freethinker Yunus Sheikh to safety in Europe. In India, he successfully led the campaign for rehabilitation and protection for the rights of uh, Sambhavi, a child who was claimed as a reincarnation of Buddhist goddess. Amongst his many accomplishments, he was also one of the signatories for the 2003 Humanist Manifesto. He is also a prolific writer in English, French, and Telugu. He was a columnist for the Hyderabad-based daily newspaper Post Noon and wrote a column called The Human Angle. He has also hosted a multi-language TV series called The Big Question and Babu Goginini, offering a humanist perspective on science and civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Babu Goginini. Thank you, friends, for such a warm welcome. Um, Sri Vavila Lagaru said, yesterday was a party, but all these three days I have been here. It was a treat to see the commitment and energy of someone twice my age, and to enjoy the gracious hospitality that people here, especially my new friend Sanjay, have been um, willing to offer me. I'm immensely grateful that so many humanist, atheist friends, as well as it looks like a reunion of people from Hyderabad. Um, so it is, it is really wonderful to be here uh, amongst you. I thought we will spend some time talking about issues that should matter to all of us, but somehow have fallen by the side. Um, in the frenzy of economics and various politics that some very civilizationally important values and ideas seem to be ignored by people. My effort has been to put some focus on the social issues that really define people's lives but are not getting enough attention. I want to take you to a picture from it's a typical regular picture from India sometime in May up to mid-June. That is because we are dependent on water and once the monsoon comes, then the life of the nation picks up again because that is when the, the sowing starts and agriculture picks up. And this is usually the desperation uh, that you see is how people are, the farmers are in the country. This year, it has been not been like that. It has not been so desperate. Um, the rains have been good, and it has been something like 4% more than the average rainfall in the country. This is great. This is great in a country which has 1.3 billion people. Just to put everything in perspective, when India was independent in 1947, there were 33 crores, 330 million people in the country. And every month, every week, every day, people died of hunger in the country. That was for 330 million people. Today, 70 years after independence, despite all the problems and troubles that are reported from India, 1.3 billion people can stay alive for the next two years even if one grain of rice were not produced from today. 
to keep one sixth of humanity alive for two years, to have produced so much food and stored it, is not a mean achievement. So this is something, simply by the scale of the effort and the achievement, one should feel proud whether one is Indian or not. Because so much of humanity can be saved by the efforts of the farmers and so on. Not everyone is thinking that the rains came this time because the El Nino effect was not so bad. There are people who believe that there are other reasons why it rained this time. We should, of course, be grateful to them as well. These are the people who have performed these rituals and they do it regularly just before the rainy season and believe that their efforts are what cause the rains to come. Do not underestimate the sincerity of their purpose. They have immersed themselves in water in these barns and they are praying. This is a national effort and you have people everywhere invoking the rain gods and all the other gods. There are a lot of gods with many specializations in India. Some focus on the rain, some are for the wind, some are for fire, some are for education and so on. Incidentally, very few civilizations in the world have a god dedicated to learning. And that's very important, of course, in a country where 40% of the people, despite having a goddess of learning, are illiterate. There is not just prayer, but also ritual that helps. Periodically, before the rainy season starts, marriages of frogs are performed with hints of sympathetic magic being shown there in those pictures. And I am not sure if every time they perform this wedding and marriages of frogs, the rains come. That is because how can you be sure of marrying two frogs off without making sure that their jataka chakra, that their horo um, horoscopes are matching? Unless horoscopes match, no marriage can be successful, as surely you know. And we haven't advanced far enough to check whether same-sex marriages are allowed. But that's where we are. And sometimes it's not only to bring the rains, but to also ward off any kind of dangerous developments that you may want to marry a dog before you marry your husband because whatever, whatever misfortune may befall might befall on the first husband and not the second. That, for those who are astonished, is not unique to India. This is this woman who said she was so fed up with her husband who abandoned her that she preferred to marry her own dog in the United Kingdom. But the earlier marriage was to ward off evil. This one was to protest a husband's misbehavior. And there is a difference. The marriages of humans to non-humans came into much prominence when this world-famous beauty, uh, Mrs. Rai, uh, she was elected 1994 as Miss World something. You should not expect too much from the winners of such competitions. It is not a contestation of intelligence, it's simply of body shape. This lady married a tree before she married her husband. Uh, there were very genuine reasons for doing so. If you are born on a Tuesday, which is absolutely the wrong day to be born on, your husband might be endangered. Because anyone who marries someone who is a Mangalik will have trouble from the nine planets 
that science discovered so much later after the astrologers of India did. And there is one trick. You must marry someone else before you marry the one you love. So Aishwarya Rai, she was made to marry a banyan tree. Now that's all well and good. But if you look into the basis of the belief, the belief is that the first husband would then be harmed. There is in India a law which protects the welfare of trees. If you knowingly married a tree, knowing that your marriage to the tree would kill the tree, that obviously is an offense. And therefore, there was a case to protest this marriage. The legal uh, approach to this matter was this was a false marriage. I think those who live in the United Kingdom and the United States are familiar with the other kinds of false marriages performed by Indians just to get a visa to come here. But this was a different matter and a case was filed for performing a false marriage. I don't know how many uh, here in this audience would be affected by President Trump's travel ban. I have a solution to that. If you came from one of these six countries and you had no the redefined family and you didn't fit into those criteria, there is a temple not far from where I live. And this temple specializes in visas. So when, uh, sp especially, <laughs> especially, <laughs> Especially when you want to get a visa to the United States, um, that's the destination for the world, is it not? Um, then you go to Chilkur Balaji Temple and you pray there. And it's an elaborate prayer and you have to also make several rounds of the temple. And a visa is guaranteed for those who get it. <laughs> yeah. um, this is how, of course, this works. And before you travel, when you get your visa and you travel, it's all right to depend on modern technology, but there are other ways of making sure you're safe. A bit of lemon and chili and some turmeric powder is the best guarantee of making sure that your flight takes off and lands safely. Do not ignore the chili and the le lemons hanging from the aeroplanes chassis. This, of course, is a joke, but this is caricaturing something that happens day in and day out. Those of you who have friends from India, if you're not Indian yourself, check their Facebook pages when they buy a new car. Every new car will have a garland. It'll have lemon and chili hanging from it so that you will never have any accident but mind you, they still buy their insurance. So they don't always all believe in what they believe. There are so many comic things happening, so many surprising things happening. I just want to show you one more picture of what has astonished even Indians. What I'm going to show you is a scene from the legislative assembly of one of the uh, states of India. India is a union of states and the states have their own legislatures and a Jain monk was invited to the assembly to give the first speech. I think even here when the Congress sessions start you have people from various religions to come and make their share their good, good wishes or make their pronouncements and so on. And many Indians felt very proud that a Hindu lady was invited to say some good words before the session started. Um, I think there is a lot of disquiet in the Western world about women who cover themselves completely and who are going around in the burqa well, for such people, here is some relief. Here is, here is a Jain monk 
who there are different kinds of Jains in the Jain religion, and some believe in not wearing clothes. And this gentleman was invited uh, to the assembly to make his speech, and he very rightly criticized the bad trends in modern society, which includes, of course, wearing clothes. <laughs> uh, I, I think we might spend a whole day joking about these people. But I want to take us back ourselves to a very somber moment in Europe's history. I'm sure many of you recognize this etching by the great Goya from Spain. 1797, I think, he made this etching. And he calls it that. The sleep of reason brings forth monsters. So there is this bourgeois gentleman, his head in repose. Presumably that is reason. And you have these creatures of the dark coming and invading. That, sadly, was what was happening in Europe of that time. And so scared was Goya that after making this etching, he destroyed it for fear that the Catholic Church might kill him for that. Of course, not too long ago, in civilizational terms, not too long ago, they had killed, burnt Bruno, and they had imprisoned Galileo, and this was not a risk he was going to take. I'm sure he didn't have chilies and lemon to protect himself, so he had to destroy uh, his artistic work. Speaking of the Indian subcontinent context, we can list out a huge number of things that are going wrong. That's not unique to the Indian subcontinent. If you went to Africa, if you looked at any of the 54 countries of Africa, you would see that people are suffering from superstition, by suffering from unchallenged beliefs, from blind beliefs. 50,000 children in the city of Kinshasa who are not orphans live in the streets. These children have been, so to say, cast out of their homes because some evangelical character identified the signs of the devil in the faces or the bodies of these little innocent children. And that has led these parents to push these children out of their homes, lest that misfortune befall them. We are talking real human problems. We are not talking simply of lime and chili and other things. We are talking of serious things that impact the lives of people. Can we even begin to understand how much deluded those parents should have been to have cast out their own children because the sign of the devil was found on their child's body? In Ghana, women are routinely arrested and put in camps and administered poisonous drugs so that they can be cured, so to say, of the extraordinary powers they are believed to have as witches. So women are imprisoned and given poison because people think that they have special powers. Again in Ghana, perhaps to lighten our mood, we can recall to ourselves the fact that a goat was once arrested on charges of theft because the police sincerely believed that the thief turned into a goat and that was his way of escaping. No way, they make a biryani out of the goat. And they got the goat. And this is not merely hearsay. I've been in Nigeria and I brought back a souvenirs. I peeled it out from, from the wall where it was stuck 
a promise to people who were angry about others that this magic man would change them into dogs and you only had to pay him a few nayara to achieve this feat. We know about evolution, so reverse evolution also should be possible. Sometimes human becoming dog shouldn't be that difficult for us to imagine. And this was a service offered and people were charging money for this. So this is the kind of strange and weird world that we get to when we are looking at people's superstitions. For India, this is a tragedy. A tragedy because once India had known reason, a long time ago, India had discovered humanism, celebrated it, and propagated it. I'm not talking of Buddhism as religion, but the ideas of the Buddha who spoke about a non-religious morality. There was no invocation by the Buddha of any god or any supernatural powers to talk about morality. His eightfold path was the right living and right thinking, right action, and so on and so forth. And this is wonderful that this man, 2,500 odd years ago, says, do not accept anything even if I say it myself, till you have verified, till you have applied the test of reason. What an extraordinary man. And before the Buddha and after him, there was a very active humanist, rationalist, skeptic tradition in India till it was defeated by the forces of unreason. So India's tragedy is poignant because once, at one time in the past, India had reason like it does not have today. And we have been suggesting, demanding, pleading, imploring that we should look at the dangers of superstition with the perspective of one who loves humans and not religion. Because the damage that superstition is doing to people's lives is immeasurable. We reach out to schools, to colleges, to teachers, talking and discussing with them how we might improve the role of reason in personal and public lives. This would be at a training program for teachers. This at a mass meeting that we organized. There are hundreds and thousands of children and young people and teachers who do come and share their ideas. And one regular question they ask is, well, if all this is not true, how come the prime minister has been with this guy or the president of the republic has been with that person claiming special powers, claiming to have the influence of the planets and so on, on people's lives? That's a question we find very difficult to answer. What is easier to answer is when they say, this particular person performed these special feats. If he did not have divine powers or special abilities, how could he do that? One would be typically people walking on burning embers. You know, um, burning embers are laid out and people quickly walk on the, uh, on the coal and they come out unscathed. So they say if people can handle fire like that, how can it be if they were not superhuman? So there are feats that rationalists do. Here is a little child, if it's clear at all. She has a wet cloth on her head and on her hands. In her hands is also lit camphor. And it doesn't hurt the child. It's very simple. Camphor, when you, normally you have solid liquid uh, phases for matter, but camphor without becoming liquid just vaporizes. So it creates that protection. It's called the Leiden frost effect. It creates that protection so that your skin is not burned. 
I'm not talking about people who are sitting on fire. I'm talking about people who are rushing quickly. Walking on fire is a polite way of saying running on fire. Mm -hmm. um, so your contact with the burning ember is not even half a second. Just run. And anyone can try it. I can guarantee you that if there is burning embers there, you will be really very fast. Um, <laughs> And we also involve, there are some top politicians there. I am administering an oath to the politicians who came to that meeting that they in their individual and official capacity would not promote superstition because the effect of superstition is really, really damaging to the country. Those of you who have seen the film PK might recognize a trick that was shown for a few seconds during the film. Look at this child floating in the air just on the strength of his spiritual achievements until of course you pull out. There is a nice stand which is created out of the metal and the tubing is done well so the child is happy. And there is a star performer of the humanist rationalist movement, Mr. Chandraya, um, who I have seen captivates crowds of 10,000 with his, with his magic and magic of his words. And he's demonstrating how that trick can be performed. But it's not just tricks. As I said, it destroys lives of people and that is what our focus has been on. I come from Hyderabad. Hyderabad is one of the technology cities of the country. Uh, the first would be Bangalore and then you would have a few other cities and Bangalore, uh, Hyderabad would be one of them. And I live in what is called the high-tech city area. So that's where all the technology companies have set up home. 130 kilometers from that city's spot, there was, as reported in the newspapers, the lynching of a man by stoning him by people who thought that he was a witch a doctor. And because he was performing witchcraft, three other children, um, three children in other people's homes in that village were dead. So the only thing the village knew to do was to bring that man to the center of the village outside the temple to which this man had no access because he was born untouchable. Within the premises of the town hall, the Sarpanch and the Panchayat office, and they stoned him to death there. This was an old man in his 60s in a country where life expectancy is 67 for men, and they killed him there, 400 people together. When we got news of it, and we went to visit the village with a team of rationalists and humanists and science popularizers, along with armed escort, because if a village went into the hysteria of killing a man, and 400 of them did it, do not think that they would spare the rationalists or the police. So we went with armed escort and we visited the home of the widow, the recent widow. And as you can see in the picture there, she hugged me and wailed that in the three days since her husband was killed in, this, in the village um, square, not to one person, not even her neighbor, came to commiserate with her. Do you see the collapse of human solidarity? That 400 people can get together to kill another person, whatever the basis of that belief might be, that they could do this. And that this is happening not in Afghanistan or Nigeria, but so close to actually the high-tech city, a pivot for modern technology, in a state which, ha which at that point had 90 million people. And how can anyone explain this? We are talking 
six people in a family kill, including a three-year-old child on charges of doing witchcraft. We are talking just two years ago. And many women have been killed. The official count is only from uh, the uh, crime bureau uh, statistics, and that counts only the women killed. And that is in 15 years, there were 2,500 women. All because of this chili and that lemon and some turmeric. Stuff that you use every Sunday in India to make a biryani. And suddenly, with a dead chicken outside somebody's home, it appears that someone is out to get you and then, in self-defense, you try to look for people who have done this to you. Identify the person and kill that person. This is what happened to Mr. Niranjan, the old man who was lynched to death. The great Ingersoll from this country told us so well and so clearly, like no one else, what superstition was. For our purposes, if anyone attributes special powers to everyday objects and holds that belief despite evidence or in spite of evidence, then you would call it superstition. And we are flooded in the country today. There are people who have colored threads in their wrists. They are tied for good luck. You would call them a talisman. You would get it from a holy man. You would pick it up from a temple for a fee. You would have people wearing rings on their fingers with magic stones. Stones suddenly which become a hundred times their value just because someone said it now brings you good luck. We are confronted we are the subject of so much of exploitation in the country. Every day in the TV channels, there are sponsored advertisements for people who promise you a better life if you are willing to change the spelling of your name because your name was spelled wrong. Your luck has ducked out. This is, of course, a Greek superstition, but that is imported successfully into India. Talk about globalization. The other globalization everyone uh, is a victim of is of course astrology, which started in Babylonia, went to Egypt, went to Greece, and with Alexander, the Macedonian rascal, comes to India. I do not ever understand why he's called the great. All he did was attack, pillage, and maraud. But coming back to how people's lives are impacted, here is a picture from a village. You can see the homes behind this woman are burnt. The newspapers had reported that homes caught fire, and which rationalist can explain this? How science can explain this? The newspapers are challenging the rationalists. So we took up the challenge and we visited the place. And that poor woman and a hundred others like her who left their homes because they were burned down and they believed it was because of some evil spirits were wailing and very, very distressed. So we went there with our team of science popularizers, people who can debunk any belief in miracles and spirits. And we made our inquiries. It turns out that phosphorus, I think those of us who have been to school know the properties of phosphorus. When exposed to dry air, phosphorus can catch fire. All one has to do is go and put some <laughs> phosphorus in the kind of wet, um, 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 animal excreta, and that could be cow excreta, 
gobar as it is called, cow dung. And when cow dung is left to dry, slowly the phosphorus is ready to inflame. And there is nobody when it is catching fire. It looks like it's spontaneous. Obviously, someone should have an interest in this. So when we investigate why or how this has been happening and who has been visiting this remote village, we understand that some people had come there and warned them that it is not just the houses, soon it will be the cows and very soon after it will be their children who would die. We tried to find out who this person was. We understand that this person has a son who is a student in a chemical engineering department. Phosphorus is not readily available in the market, but in the chemistry laboratory it is. And the man, the son's father, is a tantric, one who sells these services to help people who have spirits and other evil forces damaging their lives. So this was a business plan, well executed by two unscrupulous criminals. One with the technology and the knowledge of science, the other with a greater expertise on the superstitious beliefs and fears and ignorance of people. This same, our great Ingersoll, I think said that superstition is the child of ignorance and the mother of misery. And that is what it led these poor, vulnerable people to. The moment the police came in, all spirits disappeared and all spontaneous burning stopped. So we know how to stop these things. We just need the will to bring ourselves to do that. Really, that is what is needed. And when houses catch fire, children die, your cattle disappears, there is someone gaining out of it. We need to find out who that is, identify the person, <laughs> expose them. The most crucial thing here is the several people who came to this village to say that they had a solution for their misery, all suggested that they should build a temple. The building of the temple was the insurance against this. You know what? This was a village where the school had closed down. The two competing institutions of society, the temple and the school, the school lost and therefore the temple was gaining. If there were a school, there would be a teacher coming there, somebody with more knowledge than the victims of this superstition. There was a likelihood that the children would be learning their science and understand how the universe works. So this is damaging to the country, but we also see what is happening. People are depending less on human knowledge and more on their beliefs in these spirits. This is what one would call the eclipse of reason. Eclipses are occasions in the country for great turmoil, disturbance, mischief as well. When I was a college student, there was an eclipse in, if anyone did the India tour, you would have definitely gone to Agra, which is where the Taj Mahal is. Now, the eclipse was in Agra, and Agra Fort was supposed to be the place from where to watch the eclipse. I live 1,500, 1,400 kilometers away from there, and uh, you know that someone boasted, it's a joke, someone boasted that in Russia, you could take a train and you could travel for 24 hours and you would still be in the same country. And the Indian said, we have trains like that too. <laughs> so I was, in my college days, I was in a train like that. And it takes 30 hours to get there. When I get there, I do not exaggerate. There must have been 150 at best people 
outside in the streets during a total solar eclipse. Where were the others? Inside their homes, having locked their rooms, closed their windows, and having started fasting from before the eclipse started. I don't like those querulous looks on your face. Don't you know that during eclipse, there are these special rays that come looking for the Hindus, and especially the Hindu women, and especially the Hindu women who are pregnant, to then go and damage their fetuses. It's in self-preservation that they close their doors and their windows, and they did not eat. And Agra is a place which has educational institutions, which has PhDs and professors. They were all inside their homes, the fools, because they feared some special race came because simply of a shadow of a planet or a satellite. This is what people are driven by. They are scared. And televisions have a lot of business during that time. Imagine you're all at home, you haven't eaten, you can't go out, what will you do? <laughs> so that is exactly when we should be in the television studios, because they are watching you. Because then you get to speak to them. Apparently, I learned from CNN this morning, that when a GOP member wanted the attention of the president, he went onto TV because that's what the president is watching. Um, so he must have learned this technique from us. Um, so, we, so, so we take advantage, and I do not want to make this a personal story. There are many, many of my colleagues who do a lot more work than some of us manage to do, who are trying to spread the culture of science. So this television program is, um, it's in my mother tongue. Uh, I speak Telugu, that's my mother tongue. It's the 13th largest language group in the world. Um, and this television channel was saying, oh, the 15th, this is the 15th of January some time ago, and said, wow, Ammo, oh, oh dear, it's the 15th. There's so much disaster on its way. Um, after this uh, discussion, they got in an astrologer also. And he said, there's going to be disaster this year. This happened to be particularly a lunar eclipse. And he said, there's going to be disaster and there will be a change of government. Ah, something concrete finally. <laughs> so I said, in which country? This fool did not know that the lunar eclipse can have many countries covered. The solar eclipse is narrow. And he said, oh, it's only about India we talk. Astrology is about India. Now, that's very nice. We knew that because we all know astrology and we believe it is true, we know that the Earth is at the center of the universe, don't we? Now, we also know that India is at the center of that universe. <laughs> which is wonderful for all of us Indians. Every, every chance, every opportunity to make money, to deceive, and to do it in the name of India's heritage is taken up by these people. But then reason also provokes people. This was outside a TV channel when we were having a discussion about a cult which was administering drugs to its members so that they can remain in the fold. And while the discussion was on, the members of the cult came. They stood outside the TV studio. Some of them came with their scissors and various cutters and pliers so that they could cut the, chan uh, the uh, cables which would take them to the satellite. So this kind of reaction is also common. It's not as if we are working in an empty space. That's the anchor who was interviewing us about a man who said that he was the latest avatar of Lord Vishnu. And I, I think you all know, 
he didn't hit me finally, but he was trying to. Uh, this man is an MD. He is a doctor, but he's not just an MBBS, but he's much more than that. He believes that dead people can be born again, and he also believes that you can be hypnotized to go back to a past life. I did suggest helpfully in one TV discussion when I first met this fellow, that next time he goes into his past life, can somebody close the door? <laughs> um, that, <laughs> that, that did not happen, but this man and I were having an argument, and I said I should get his degree revoked from the university for believing that dead people can be born again. But the belief in someone dying and coming back to life with another body is widespread. It's widespread and you can see that when you die in India, you're usually reborn in India, visa problems. So you can only be born <laughs> in the country that you die in. Uh, why can't you be born in Pakistan? Because they'll chop your head off uh, <laughs> if you say that. Uh, but it is obviously a culturally conditioned belief that dead people can be brought back to life. There is a calculation today that in the 1900s were alive on the earth more people than have been born as people in the last 100,000 odd years. Well, there is a mathematical problem there. Where do you get those extra souls for all these new people coming up? You can't keep dividing souls. Each one needs to have his own, right? So, apart from the mathematical problem, there's a theological issue as well. If everyone's getting reborn, what will you do with heaven and hell? When will you ever get punished? If all you're doing is getting recycled like beer. But people do take advantage of these things. Here is a ruffian who many of you here revere as a great man, and that is a Dalai Lama. He is the 13th Dalai Lama. He was first born in the 1300s and is the same guy, just recycling. He's born again and again and again. This is a belief in the mountain regions of India, North India. Imagine those of you who eat meat. Imagine the chicken you ate yesterday came back to life. Imagine all the hundreds of chicken that you have ever eaten in your life ganging up together and attacking you suddenly because they all came back to life. That's ridiculous. But this people believe. The Dalai Lama is cuddling that lovable little child who he identified as a reborn old friend of his. His childhood mate was reborn and he's speaking to the child and together they're performing a lot of rituals and things to save the world and to make Tibet independent. Don't you forget, Tibet needs to be liberated um, and to make China a democracy. So all this was going on and we said, somebody has to respond to this and we did. And when we responded, they were, uh, there was a, that child, that child who was identified, her name was Shambhavi. Vishal, you got my name right, but her name is Shambhavi. Shambhavi is the wife of uh, the consort, the divine consort of uh, Lord Shiva. So Shambhavi was claimed to have been born in the holiest of Indian cities, Varanasi, Kashi, and born to unknown but Brahmin parents. How can you know the caste when you don't know the parents? But the story is good. In the most divine, holy Hindu temple, temple city, born to Brahmins is a child who was once the companion of the Dalai Lama, who himself is almost God incarnate, and in addition, he has a Nobel Prize, so which helps. Do you know of any other divine person who had a Nobel Peace Prize? No. So this guy is special. So, 
So he has this friend who is now 70 years younger to him and together they are doing these things to save the world. So we said, you can't be doing this. This child should be in school, not in a temple. Because already, by the time this matter became public, they installed the child in a temple asking devotees to go and pay their respects to the child. They were thousands of people in queues waiting to have a glimpse of this child who it was reputed could speak any language of any place. You only had to take the child somewhere. So she came to Telugu land, she spoke Telugu, she was taken to Tamil land, she spoke Tamil, she was in Varanasi, so she spoke um, Hindi, Sanskrit as well, I think. So we said, this can't be, stop this, send the child to school. Uh-huh, that's not allowed. How dare you protest against a holy thing in my religion? You are anti-Hindu, that is why you are doing this. So this is television coverage of protests against what I was doing, and a lot of them, not one or two, um, all of them saying I should be restrained from stopping um, the Dalai Lama from promoting this child. And this is a picture of uh, my speaking to some t television channel and some of them being arrested by the police. You are against Hinduism, they said. I said, keep quiet, the Dalai Lama is Buddhist, so go away. You don't even know which religion he belongs to. You don't even know what your religion is all about. Then they said, you are targeting this child only because this is a religious person. I said, who else is there to help? They said, in my street there are so many children not going to school. So we said, so in your neighborhood there are children who don't go to school and you want someone living 400 kilometers away to come and help that child. What about yourself? Why would you not take that child to school that you are asking me, demanding that I come and act there? And I said to the fool, he asked me this question on uh, live television, said, have you realized, did you think that my humanity has no religion, but your religion has no humanity. And that was played many, many times, just to remind people that invocation of God and religion is no guarantee of being conscious of one's own humanity and human impulses. The matter went to the Human Rights Commission, where I pleaded my case, and in this case, my points were three. Number one, the child was being exploited by the media who made a circus out of this. The child was in the studios when she was not in the temple and they were asking the child questions about the future of the world. It was all the best word and I don't think there's an equivalent in other languages that I know, tamasha. Tamasha is a farce, a play, of the kind that played out in the Scopes trial here. That kind of circus was being played with this child. So my first request to the Human Rights Commission was to restrain the media from interviewing this child after earthly hours and to stop exploiting her in this manner. The second was that the government should appoint an investigative commission to look into the claims made on behalf of the child. And the third was to restrain the Dalai Lama, who has had a history of grooming little babies and children to be part of his religion. Look, this is a problem except for Islam of all religions. There are no more priests joining them. They have to groom new people and get them in. There was a time the Christians were especially in Kerala, uh, where the Christians were giving them free education and then bringing them into the uh, brotherhood and fatherhood um, clerical roles. That also stopped. This was the Dalai Lama's way of doing it. And I did not forget to remind the Human Rights Commission 
that the Dalai Lama also said on a particular anniversary of his leaving China for India because he was asked to pay taxes. You were asked to pay taxes, so you leave the country. That's not a new story, right? Now, he comes to India and he announces, because he's now getting, at that point he was 75, now that he's getting to the end of this life so that he could prepare for the next one, don't you forget, he will come back. So number 13, preparing for number 14, announced that because China has not as much religious freedom as I would like to, I will not be reborn in China. Now look at this, travel arrangements. I will not be reborn in China. I can decide where I can go. Just call, I don't know what, um, makemytrip.com and say, <laughs> and say, let me be born in Burma or something. Then he said, maybe I'll be born in India because India is safe and it gave him asylum and honored him and allowed him to build his own fictitious capital of Tibet, outside Tibet. Uh, and then he also said, I don't need to be born as a boy, I could be born as a girl. Now, get these things together. Aha, so you can be reborn as a girl and in India and in South India. So this is all very clever. But whether you're Dalai Lama or not, when you're 75, you're likely to be senile. So the guy said, I can even be reborn before I die. I challenge you to figure that out. <laughs> I will be reborn before I die. So this was the media at the Human Rights Commission on the day the judge, uh, the Honorable Justice Subhashan Reddy, gave his judgment, his orders, sorry. And for the first time in the history of the world's jurisprudence, a judicial order was made, which made it criminal to attribute, without the basis of fact, any supernatural powers to any child, because that would be a denial of the child rights of that person. Simply the right to be treated as a child, to play, to go to school. And that was an important judgment because she started going to school. But this took two and a half years. It also took many, many hundreds of hours of television time campaigning for the rights of this child. But that also changed the vision of what humanists stood for. They were not simply fighting the idea of God. Why should I be obsessed? I was saying to um, my friend Sanjay yesterday, and he said, no, no, repeat it also tomorrow. I said, there are only two kinds of people obsessed with God. One, the religious, second, the atheist. <laughs> All the time talking of God. <laughs> but, but we, are more engaged with humans. Humanism is about humans. The philosophy of life of humans is humanism. The philosophy of gods is religion. We want to look at what will make life for humans better and more human. And that's when, and that's why, we fight the eclipse of reason. I mentioned to you that we had uh, these t TV shows for eclipses. The taboo is you should not ever cook during the eclipse. Remember those rays, those special rays that come? Uh, they have a, a dangerous effect on the human body. So it's best not to cook. And if you did have to cook, just make sure you did not cut eggplant, brinjal. Brinjal is really dangerous for pregnant women. And don't you ever do any of this outside in the public. So this is what the humanists did. <laughs> so they organized a big get together. Once a year because the earth goes around the sun and comes back to the same spot, once in 365 days, 
You have all these celebrations starting from Sydney up to the end of the world, marking the New Year Day. The eclipse is rarer than those 365 days, once in 365 days. So we must have a grander celebration for an eclipse. It may visit the place after 5,000 days, something like that. So let's have a party. Let's cook food. Let's cook good food and let's enjoy. And those of us, I think in August, um, definitely near St. Louis and Chicago, there is going to be a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse going to happen. I am hopeful that all of you are willing to take a look at that magnificent spectacle in the sky, that wonderful play of shadow and light. I can tell you, when on that day I went to the Agra fort and I had only those 150 fellow science enthusiasts sleeping on the floor so we could all see the sun, that grand life giver for all of us. And there is this two seconds, not more, maybe three, when the eclipse gives rise to the diamond ring. Believe me, there is nothing that you can ever see anywhere that can match that feeling. And the guy lying down on the floor next to me spontaneously said, after this, it's okay if I lose my sight. He was in rapture. Just that sheer beauty of that magnificent celestial spectacle. And we want people to enjoy life. Humanism is about this life, this world, our values. And life is about celebration. Not that there is no tragedy, but that life is all of this together. And we should be able to meet it without fear and celebration and invite it. And marking an eclipse and watching it is, is a great thing to do if you have the right kind of spectacles to view it with, the filters. Uh-huh. How dare you hurt our feelings? How dare you eat in public when we know that it is not good? We will not let you cook in public. You want to attack my religion and my religious beliefs. So the guys came with the police and the police said, you can't have this public celebration. You can't invite the eclipse in this way. The only way to greet the eclipse is by staying home, closing the doors, pulling down the curtains and fasting during that time. And that's the police. But happily, that's an eclipse baby, solar eclipse baby. The mother was pregnant with the baby, with the fetus. She cooked in public. What is significant about this lady? She did it in the untouchable colonies of Surya Pet. The educated PhDs were sitting in their houses, covering like cowards. And here was this lady with just a bachelor's degree from university, but a lot of common sense much more common sense than that silly woman who married a tree before she married one of India's famous actors. She gave birth to this beautiful baby. No problems. There was no cleft lip, which is what everyone said would be the result of such things. And you know what? The guys who pulled down the um, marquees, the, uh, the tents, and who attacked physically the humanists. They said, you are cutting vegetables. You are also cutting apples here. We know which religion you are representing. Don't you know which religion apple belongs to? <laughs> the... <laughs> The fear, <laughs> the fear that people have of being converted to another religion, the fear that people have for knowledge, the challenge that they are unwilling to take to adjust their beliefs to the latest of knowledge, that 
is that intersection where the darkness of superstition is flourishing. A lot of people are afraid that you will leave your religion and go. That is the kind of fear with different levels and degrees of intolerance exists in all religions. A few hundred years ago, try leaving Catholicism and becoming a Protestant. The Pilgrim Fathers wouldn't have come here if it was so easy in Europe. Try saying you're not a Muslim anymore in any of the Islamic countries and see what will happen. The same kind of phenomenon are also here. I will quickly go to some other ideas. Because we have such a grand heritage. Why should these people who became civilized only a few years, few hundred years ago, come and take away from my grand civilization which was there for 900,000 years? Was it not when Lord Rama was alive on earth? Of course, modern science has not yet caught up with these numbers because we are saying the first modern human could have, may have lived only 200,000 years ago. Our imaginary fictional grandmother Lucy. But no, our civilization is 900,000 years old and we speak a language of the gods and our books are given to us by the gods. These are revelations and ours is not a religion, it is a way of life, as if the rest is not a way of life. And therefore, to announce, to applaud, and to celebrate the greatness of one's culture, one has to find modern technology in old times. Do you know the story of the Egyptian and the Indian who met together? Uh, the Egyptian, also in a crisis of identity, says to the Indian, Egypt had great technology in the past. When we were doing this digging, even though they were not Islamic, already near the pyramids, we found telephone cables. And telephone cables means several thousand years ago, we had telephony in Egypt. The Indian laughed as any Indian would. And he said, you know what? No cables found in India. We had mobile telephony then. <laughs> <laughs> and, and fun is made because not all of our discussions are with enemies, they are friends. Sometimes people you tease, and sometimes you say, well, there was Wi-Fi in olden times as well. <laughs> and I dare tell you, the, the signal matches the one in this room. And those of you who, who have this mistaken, <laughs> this mistaken idea, that Facebook was invented in India, uh, in US, there you are. <laughs> Already reflected in a Telugu film in the 1950s, what the Indians achieved 10,000 years ago. We had the first laptop, and that was when they were having a Facebook chat. Right. Uh, so this is where we are. We have all kinds of influences many of them which are putting pressure on the Indian mind. And sadly, some are going back to the imaginary, imagined security of an ancient India and her achievements. India's great achievements would be in mathematics, would be in metallurgy, would be in astronomy, independent of Aristotle, but 700 years after Aristotle, many of those things were done by the Indians. You don't have to be the first to do anything. The first to do anything really depends on that guy's parents. You're born first, you did it. But that's not the point. That cultures and societies were able to celebrate knowledge and pursue it and establish truths about the universe. India participated fully in that human enterprise. And that would be something the country should be proud of. That should be something everybody should be proud of. Like I am proud of the Egyptians and the Greeks. 
so should others be of what is achieved in China or Iraq. It's all right to say the Greeks did it first, but would they do it without the Egyptians and where would the Egyptians be without the Babylonians? The ones who are the worst affected by religious turmoil today are those who lived in Babylonia, that's Iraq. People who spoke like us were not always welcome, rarely safe. To the left you see an icon of Indian independence movement. He was a militant, he, yield, he wielded the gun and he threw bombs and he was given the death penalty by the colonial government. While waiting in prison for the death penalty to be implemented, the great Sardar Bhagat Singh wrote, why I am an atheist? when everyone was imploring him to go to God for he had very few days, he explained why he was not a believer. And I can tell you that this is more interesting than Shelley's necessity of atheism. To the right is Dr. Narendra Dabolkar who was slain for his rationalism. He was asking for a law which would regulate not belief, but the exploitation of people in the name of belief. So no one will stop you from believing what you want to, but if someone's making a business out of it and telling you that he would cast a horoscope and tell you what the future will be, if the future is nowhere near that, then you should be allowed to seek redressal for that and to stop people from being exploited. There is, that is fresh on the tap. Um, there is this belief that the urine of this mammal, I prefer drinking the milk, but that's, we should not interfere with personal preferences. Um, and, and that is considered a good antidote for any kind of um, uh, diseases, especially cancer. He means it, he means it. Um, and this is not unique to India. Many people think that this is only about the people of India. In, in um, Arab lands, the urine of camel is given the same qualities as that of the cow in India. I'll try to bring it to a close because I'm sure there'll be a chance for um, discussion as well. But I want to tell you one interesting story. Um, astrologers claim to know what is coming for you, but how do they know what's coming for them? We have been challenging and I in no way should line myself up with those greats that you see there. The great Abraham Kovur, Dr. Um, Professor Nasimaya, Dr. P. M. Bhargava, one of the world's <coughs> foremost cell biologists. Narendra Dabulkar who was killed. Narendra Nayak, Professor Nayak is the president of the Federation of Rationalist Associations of India. They've had traditional challenges. The challenge was here is my check, like James Randi, uh, who has withdrawn the challenge because he's now very old. Um, here is the check, come prove something, take the money. Uh, but modern world requires modern packaging of the same challenge. Who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> this was very active on Indian television, so that's the thing to do. So I put on stake money that I don't have, and I said, come prove it and get the money. And that was the time of the elections in India. So we said, here are these 25 questions about the election and its results. You must get, because you say astrology is a science, you must get with an experimental error something correct. So let's say you get 18 correct, you will get, actually it was 10 million. I offered one crore rupees. That was the worth of the home I was living in. 
I was saved from homelessness by science. Because, because we said, come prove your claims to telling the truth, uh, the future. And out of the 25 questions, answer 18 correctly. Three or four questions that we had in these 25 related to non-existent contestants in the, in the elections. So the guys did not even contest the elections. We had a few political parties which don't exist in our question. And the astrologers very dutifully and sincerely gave votes also to these people. <laughs> then we did an experiment. We got children who didn't yet pass their class 10. And we gave them the same questionnaire. Want to guess who won? <laughs> the children did better than them. The astrologers got two or three, the highest was six out of 25. The children got nine out of 25 questions. So this was a way of publicly challenging them. It was widely covered in newspapers and everywhere. And some people said, I'm going to take up the challenge. So we met all these characters in television stations. <laughs> these guys, all of them, they have degrees from the Telugu University in astrology and, and geomancy. Geomancy is uh, feng shui of the Chinese and vastu of the Indians. For them, they need a flat earth and they need the earth to be the center of the universe. Even Galileo did not get it right. How do you think you will get it right? And they didn't. They thought that the earth was at the center of the universe. And they failed miserably, all of them. And that's bloody good, isn't it? There are millions of people watching television. And one after the other, they fall down without being able to give the right um, answers. But something else happened. This was the almanac of the Telugu people. And this is a tradition in South India and also Central India. So at the onset of the new year, which is the Luni solar calendar in India, uh, you have someone reading out the predictions for the year. The farmers will be safe and the, um, the king has to be careful. They haven't upgraded yet. So it's still the king who they interpret as a ruler. Uh, who has to be careful, the ministers might betray, and nonsense like that. This guy, he, in his predictions, also gives some caution. You know, the first time a young woman, a young girl, uh, has her puberty and her first menstruation, the timing of that menstruation is very important. If that period, comes in the morning, then life is okay for her. But careful the ones whose children, whose daughters have their menarche, the onset of uh, menstruation, in the evening, if it's after six, if it's after eight, there are serious consequences. You may have the wrong kind of husband, your body may be shapeless, you may become a prostitute, and so on and so forth. Same that fellow. So, in India, there is a law that protects people from outraging the modesty of women. Ta-da! Someone goes to the court, files a case, it's a criminal case, to demean a woman in this manner. So he was absconding from the law for nearly a year and a half. I think that was something he didn't know was coming. Just want to give you a glimpse of the great Aril Edwardson, the great but late Aril Edwardson. He has his own monogram plane. He traveled, used to travel around the world and bringing back to life dead people. That's what Christians do, don't they? <laughs> yes, from, starting from the first guy who came back after the third day. Uh, dead people, of what use are they? So bring them back to life. So go to Pakistan, go to Nigeria, and then find a dead baby and breathe life into the baby. And why you wouldn't do it for children in Norway, I don't know. Why this partiality for Nigerians, can't tell you. But that's what this rascal used to do. 
So he came to my city where you can't say this, but you can say other things. So he made a lot of false claims. Up there is my senior friend, uh, Levi Fragel, one of the important, most important leaders of the humanist movement in the world. And he brought information and recruited me into exposing this charlatan. And he was exposed in Norway on Saturday night, primetime television. Chap died six months later. The guy who used to, I don't think he's come back to life yet. Um, but he was one of the biggest tricksters of the Western world who had met some resistance back in India. I'm sure you know this painting. Um, anyone who fights the claims of religion is accused of blaspheming, is accused of hurting the religious sentiment of someone. And this was the case of Dr. Yunus Sheikh, somebody who in Pakistan got the death penalty for having blasphemed the prophet and the, and the, the religious beliefs of the Muslims. It took us three years to bring him out, Dr. Yunus Sheikh. He's somewhere in Europe now, safe. But clearly, nobody can remain undamaged after three years of death cell in Pakistan when you don't even know who is going to kill you. Is it the police? Is it a fellow prisoner? Or will it be the legal system which finally will kill you? But he's not alone. If India is troublesome, it's only a picnic compared to what's happening in Bangladesh. In 17, science bloggers have been killed. They are not even speaking in public. They are only writing on their pages on the net. They've been killed for speaking science and spreading reason. And these are just a few. The great Indian humanist, Kalburgi, former vice chancellor of a university. The second person I introduced to you already, um, the great Dabolkar. And Pansare, who was 81 years old when they killed him. And it's young people who killed him. Can you see what that means? All these three people were killed by youngsters. The mindset of the young is fearing the fresh ideas of the old. And they can only react and respond with murder. Dabolkar is great because he was told he was going to be assassinated. And the police said, we are going to provide you escorts. And he said, if you give me escorts, then they will kill the next man in the organization. I can't accept that. And he was killed. In South India, Periyar Ramaswamy established an organization for self-respect, which transformed partly uh, because of some dissidents in that group into a political party which was elected to power in South India on an agenda of rationalism. It said that it would fight the caste system and it would uh, defeat religion and superstition, religious superstition. The man who founded that said this. And this saying of his is on the pedestal of every statue that is, is put up. And there are hundreds of them in the southern state of Tamil Nadu, of which Chennai is the capital. That was 60 years ago when it was very, very, very powerful as a movement for having the same statement of Periyar on his Facebook page, this man was killed two months ago in Coimbatore, again in that same state. How do we fight this? We have to fight it with the rule of law. There is no doubt about it. Murder is murder. Assassination is assassination. Threat is threat. They are all actionable under the criminal law that exists. 
But we have to make sure that the education system will give to people the ability to think and to question. Sadly, the situation in India is that we have an examination system, not an education system. We are all the time preparing for one exam or the other, and those exams test your ability to remember things. I'll just show you what I have been trying to do using the mass media. Um, I did 30 episodes of a program which we shall refer to, the big question uh, with Babu. The idea is to deal with questions of science, philosophy, culture, and not to talk about science as one of equations and calculations, to bring the spirit of science into the perspective for children. I will say uh, with some uh, delight that when it was telecast on Sunday's morning, prime time morning, it many times competed with the Bollywood song programs on neighboring channels. So there is appetite. When children watch a program, the parents are forced to watch it along with them. There is appetite. But we have not got the resources and the ability. I took time off from everything else and did this volunteer work for one year. I can't obviously continue to do that. But it had its traction. And the traction is what gives us some hope that children are interested in these things. Are we fighting religion? No. We are fighting ignorance. Are we fighting for human rights? Absolutely. I have no issues with religion and I am not against your religion until your religion is against human rights. Otherwise, we remain in our domains and if you do not influence public policy, if you do not restrict people from believing what they want to on the basis of facts, we can have no quarrel. We all live in freedom and for freedom and there can be no government which can be religious or atheist. Governments cannot have that what you have here, the First Amendment, uh, being overridden by anyone, Johnson Amendment or otherwise. The more you let religion interfere in public life, public policy, politics, and the social affairs of the community, the greater is the scope for discord. And we want to work against that. I'll end with what old man Plato said. Plato was talking about spreading of knowledge. We all know that Plato was also one of the founders of great authoritarian ideas. Still, what he said is of great relevance to us. And he says, he's not worried about the children who are afraid of the dark. He's worried about the adults who are afraid of the light. The light of reason and the life of reason. These should be the guiding principles for a modern society and a modern world. And if we did that, then the work that we are trying to accomplish will become so much easier without interference from other sides. My invitation to all of you would be to join in this civilizational struggle. Let ever forget what Voltaire said. People who believe in absurdities, people who believe in absurdities will always commit atrocities. That is exactly what is happening around the world today. As far as South Asia is concerned, last year in the United States, we created an organization which is a South Asian Humanist Association. It's an organization which is based in the US with chapters in UK, in France, in Germany, in Canada. And the idea is 
to invite people who are inclined similarly to reason, democracy, human rights, human values, secular ideas, to defend what is under very serious threat and attack in the South Asian region. That's one-sixth of humanity. And we need to do something about it, create resources. Because what happened to the Middle East is what will happen to South Asia. There's no doubt about it. And <coughs> South Asian immigrants carry the prejudices of their culture as well as the greatness of their culture when they move here. I know how ridden by caste the South Asian immigrants are outside their countries, like back home. So we have launched a challenge to those who claim that the caste system has value and merit to come and take a DNA test because they are claiming the merits of that on the basis of DNA. Every time science comes with a new idea, new knowledge, the words are borrowed for the spreading of the old superstition. So we are challenging that. I have some um, pamphlets out there. Uh, I wasn't sure how many of you would stay till the end, so I kept some goodies with me which are keychains of the South Asian Humanist Association. Thank you for staying this long. You can pick them up on your way out. Thank you. So coming into this, you know, I'll just speak uh, on my own behalf before we head to the next part of the program. I did not know what to expect. I mean, I did a good job of uh, looking up your profile on Wikipedia and I pulled out and I rattled it off and I mispronounced a couple of names here and there. But I must say from the bottom of my heart, I'm thoroughly impressed by this and most importantly what I wanted to express at least from where I'm coming from is after having seen this, I understand the risk that you are taking, especially where you come from. You choose to be there and you choose to fight the good fight and I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Now, now we would like to break for about five minutes and then after the break, we'll come back with a question and answer session. Thank you. Does anybody in the room have a question for our keynote speaker, Mr. Babu Goginini? Sure, go ahead. Sir, we have a question. Let me first uh, commend uh, Dr. Uh, I don't know, Bob Gobinin on his standard. He did a contemporary job, but I feel that you have a gap in your knowledge. Like anybody, like uh, the Rama, Krishna, the Buddha, Jesus, or the Plato, or the Socrates, like anybody else, you have a gap in your knowledge. What would be the reason for the root cause of all evil? Good, hate, love, war, peace. What is the root cause of that? In that, if you go, probably you will find an answer. I did two decades of research and I came with one simple solution for all the problems in this world. For any problem, personal, global, national, international, political, religious, spiritual, for everything, count money in calories. That's one line solution for everything in your life or anybody's life, for global, ecological, anything. Nobody has suggested this. I named this science as anarchonics. Shakti Mulu Idhantara. When you manage energy, when you manage resources, like you know, carbon, hydrocarbon, and natural resources, and produce them properly, distribute them properly, consume them optimally, then everything can be eradicated. All the industries, all the inequalities, all the religious atrocities, everything can be eradicated. Can you go to the deep and talk on the subject? Like, you know, what is the root cause of all you and all good? Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Sir. 
Can I go deep into what you have researched? No, the, you have to do it yourself. The good karma, all you mean, the good, everything. Oh, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Banning cow slaughter is a big issue in India. Is it based on superstition or is it supported by the holy scriptures of India like Vedas, Upanishad, or Gita? That's my question. What is your take on it? Thank you. Um, this is something that India is very agitated about these last, especially these last few years. Um, the question is cow slaughter supported by the Vedas? No, I think the ancient Indian literature has recorded instances of cow slaughter, um, including in the Ramayana. Um, you would know about Charaka. Charaka was one of the most important medicine men of India. In the Charaka Samhita, this must be 15, 1600 years ago, uh, Charaka recommends the consumption of cow meat for good health for people. So the rejection of cow as meat is a recent, comparatively, more recent in origin. So whether it has sanction in the scriptures, no. Does it have anything to do with the Gita? No, I don't think the Gita even refers to that. As far as what my take on that is concerned, there is always this debate which is active in our minds and in the minds of many people, whether you should eat animals which can pe feel pain. And many of us come with our own responses to that. Some of the, us say, I will only eat fish. Some will say, I don't want mammals. Some will say, this is a cycle of life. This is how it happens. You only have to look at the mirror and check the teeth you have. We have canine teeth, and that's because we are meant to eat meat. That's how our digestive system is as well. So I don't think people would, should make a moral issue about eating meat, but they can make their choices. I don't think the law should prohibit you from eating meat. That should be your choice. But there must be regulations on how the animal should be treated at the time of slaughter. Um, that is sadly not the case. Whether it's halal or not, that is not the case today. There is another thing that evolutionary, um, well, studies in science have t told us. If human beings did not eat meat and did not get the easy protein, first from their fellow human beings, later from other animals, the development of the brain would not have been like this. So meat has had a very serious input in the growth and the abilities of the human brain. We don't say a lion is moral because it is vegetarian. It's the nature of a lion to eat meat. Humans are essentially meat eaters, but they can have that choice of not eating it. Are there grounds other than this to discuss meat consumption? I think science gives us some clues. If the pressure on the earth with this kind of population uh, has to be addressed, then maybe there is a reason to not eat at the top of the pyramid but slightly at the bottom, so that more stomachs can be filled with what limited space we have for cultivation. That would be my response. It's a complex thing, but I don't think religion should be involved in this. Knowledge, science, consequence, choice. What is happening in India today is not that. It is almost killing people on suspicion that they are having an animal's meat with them. That's obviously not allowed even by the law. So it's simply lawlessness. Thank you. All right. I'm giving you the second time the same moment talk. Okay, what it reads is Foundation for India Studies presented to Babu Gogneni 
in appreciation of his thought provoking lecture titled encounter of superstitions around the world at Houston Community College Elif Auditorium Houston Texas July 1st 2017 thank you Thank you, Thank you very much. Our uh, next question, please. Uh, thanks for your uh, wonderful presentation. What do you think of Chanikya has any good or bad influence on and as far as you know? Has he got any anything to do with uh, the way he his uh, beliefs or principles? Chanikya. Um, that is Chanakya, the author of Ardhashastra. Uh, well, I think um, as a political thinker, as a thinker in the field of economics, such as it was then, uh, it's interesting, but it can only be of historical significance. Uh, he may have come a thousand odd years before Machiavelli, who wrote The Prince in Europe, um, in Italian, uh, but both these tracts are about how to run your country and they are ideas addressed to the king. We don't have kings anymore, we have democracies. They lived in an age when spies were very important and the army was. Uh, those are not the times anymore. But what is interesting in Chanakya's ideas is how divorce could be obtained by both a woman or a man already in that time. Because in the Hindu scripture, uh, in the Hindu understanding, a marriage is a sacrament. It's not a contract. Which means it continues even after death. This is a significant thing about a sacrament that death does not end marriage. Therefore remarriage is not allowed and so on and so forth. That was the plight of India in the 1700s, 1800s. But Chanakya had sorted this out. Already in his time you could take divorce. So, very interesting. I think he's been interpreted to suit the modern needs of the Indian state. So, to talk about the nation state, they have used Chanakya. Very often on the internet you see quotations from Chanakya. Some of, some of those quotations, for fun, also refer to the internet. So, lots of fake uh, quotations from him. Yeah, a smart chap, he was a good minister and a leader of a king, who was not a Kshatriya king. The kings that Chanakya served were not Kshatriyas. Which is why the ideas of Chanakya, the rule of the Nandas, the rule of the Mauryas, soon gave in to the rule of the revived Brahminical system. So after a while, they got fed up of non-Kshatriya Brahmins ruling. Emperor Ashoka, called Ashoka the Great, was not a Kshatriya. He was not guided by the Brahmins, nor were his successors. But they couldn't sustain because the religion already was so powerful and the generals came back. And with that ended Chanakya because after that came Manudharma Shastra. Manudharma Shastra seeks to replace the, the rules and regulations that existed during the time or from the time of the Buddha up to the end of the Mauryan Empire. That's the context of Chanakya. Thank you. Yes. Power TV shows that we see on the 
how do we go? I mean, that's 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 actually trying to get the audience to believe in the belief, you know, those. And how do you how do you counteract to those situations or those those types of shows that have become like the rampant? Thank you. And it's very sad to see that in this modern idea. Absolutely agree with what you said. Uh, modern technology is used on Indian television to spread beliefs in rebirth, positions, and um, uh, memories of past life. Uh, any kind of nonsense can be packaged there. Um, the problem we have is, are you not allowed to write fiction? And should everything be about facts? Because human life has so many facets, and literature, uh, even bhakti, devotional literature, is a genre of literature. Can we ban it? No. Can we stop it? No. But your question is, how do we counteract? The resources we have are so limited. I did this TV show on my own. I took a year away from, from earning uh, to be able to do it because I feel that was a necessity. And why wait till you become old to do something good, why not do it when you have the strength? I see a lot of good, nice people who say they want to be 70 years old before they want to do something for society. Um, I don't have much sympathy for that attitude. We should do it when we have the strength. That's how I got into this. But there are very few who would encourage it as a commercial activity. Um, we need to put in resources. We have to speak with money because that's what gives us access to TV. But this much I can tell you. All the astrologers to be on TV pay the TV channels because they have sponsored programs. So they hire half an hour in the morning, four o'clock in the afternoon, up to six. We are invited, we don't pay. And while they're paying huge amounts of money to get paid, uh, they pay and get, get to the uh, discussion and get bashed up by us. So that's a level of masochism that you don't see elsewhere. No astrologer has ever won a debate with any of us. Uh, they go away bruised. And they have paid to be on channels and be invited and so on. Not particularly to our programs, but otherwise why would a channel look at these characters? who are saying everything counterintuitive against common sense, against human rights. It's because they bought a slot. Sadly, it's all a matter of money. And uh, people ultimately have to fall in with that logic. Um, I think both operate, sir. Nobody wants to believe a lie. I don't think anyone, even the, the strongest believer of the utmost nonsense, believes in it because it is true. So I think people believe something because they believe it is true. And all we can do there is provide information that can help them reassess their conclusion. Yesterday, on the um, day before yesterday, there was a radio interview I did. And I was asked, are you trying to change the minds of people? No. That's what religion does. What we do is give information, provide the tools of reasoning. It's for people to come to their conclusions. Very often, I think, and that applies to all of us, there is reluctance to learn something new. I mean, if Microsoft comes up with another version of its Windows, I couldn't care less. I just want to use the old one. We all have a resistance to picking up a new, of course, it's useless. But in general, I mean, um, we have to factor in that as well. And if you're born and by the age of one, you've been through 10 religious rituals, your head has been shaved, you've gone to the temple, every Saturday you go to the prayer room and you pray with your parents, they say, say, namaskar to your God. And if this is happening for 20 years, and someone comes then and says, challenge your um, beliefs, come on, let's have a discussion. It's, they've been brainwashed already. 
this religion business is brainwashing. And our friend Richard Dawkins has asked, have you ever wondered why Christians are born to Christians, Muslims to Muslims and Hindus to Hindus? It's because nobody has chosen, they're just indoctrinated in that. I have a question. Thank you. What is your take on uh, observer's effect, measurement problem in the subatomic particles? Observer's effect? Yeah, this is not the occasion to discuss that. <coughs> All right, any other questions? Um, you see, as I was um, briefly explaining, we set up SAHA, South Asian Humanist Association, and anyone interested can go to humanism.asia. Uh, that's simple, humanism.asia. Not .com, but .asia. We feel that South, A South Asia, we know that South Asia has sent up the largest number of people as diaspora in the world. So this region has sent people as immigrants everywhere in the world. They are in New Zealand, they are in Australia, they are in Hong Kong, they are in Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Burma, and of course in the West, we know all the countries where they are. They are also present in Africa, uh, in Uganda, in Kenya, in South Africa. You have lots of people of South Asian origin. This is the situation. In this country, in, uh, in the US, Indians are 35 lakhs, 3.5 million. We think this is a very valuable group of people here who have come here because of their knowledge and skills. So we think that many people in this community of 3.5 million will also want to be secular, but there has been no platform for them. Where do South Indians meet? They will meet at a temple, or they will go to the mosque, or they will be at the church. We want to create a neutral platform. A platform where, as an example, I'm a Telugu speaker. I've come to a Telugu group meeting here. 7,000 people attending a convention. We don't get so many in India. 7,000 at a convention, each one, I don't know, spending a thousand bucks on person's participation. But I find that the Telugu people's meeting is actually Hindu people's meeting. So we want to encourage our friends, compatriots, people with a common origin and shared experience to recognize that religion and culture are not the same. There is overlap, but they are not the same. And we would like people to develop their creative pursuits in that direction. Simple example. Uh, do you know the dance form called Bharatanatyam, Kuchipudi? Wonderful. I mean, if you sit and watch a performance, who can match that grace and elegance and wonderful performance? But if you look closely, in the last several hundred years, has the content of the dance ever changed? It's always telling the story of Lord Krishna and Radha, right? Now, the grammar is great, the vocabulary is wonderful. What should be the new sentence and communication using this dance? Friends of ours in Vijayawada have managed to retell the story of biological evolution using the mudras and the actions of Bharatanatyam. That is contemporarizing culture. That you should liberate culture from the grip, the iron grip of religious belief. That culture need not be only obsessed with mythology. That the great story of humanity is even more fascinating than the story of any epic, whichever culture, whichever language. So upgrading ourselves becoming modern, in which book of the world, the several hundred pages of the 50 different versions of the Bible or the Quran and everything else, 
which of them has the match to those two pages of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All the thousand pages of religious scripture will weigh less than those two pages of moral uh, Magna Carta of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We should move people towards that. Use the same language, use the same stories. But like the Greeks recognize the story of gods is not the history of gods, it's the story of gods. It's a story. The story aspect should be important. What we find is people who were not very religious back in South Asia, here are becoming religious. Because they are challenged to define themselves. There's a, um, especially in this state, turn your head and you'll see a cross. So you are challenged to define yourself vis-a-vis -vis the Methodist church and this church and the other and the big football stadium size gatherings you see. And because people have not thought enough, they are going to a religious identity rather than cultural. We want to challenge the caste system as well here, especially here, because they are funding and they are influencing the caste system back there in India. Uh, what else do we want to do? Actually, we want to start a university. We want to start a university that will serve the needs of the humanist community, not just South Asian. Uh, do we have the money for it? No. We're going to work on the project. We have a few people interested. We want to create resource material. Most of us, you must have also been influenced by the Kerala Yuktivadi Sangam, Narayana Guru, all those great people. They've been active for a, the movement has been active for a hundred years. We gained and they gained from contact with the Western ideas. At one time when the world was sleeping, India woke up to reason. But that has not been the case for the last 500 years. The reason that we got back in India is through the encounter with the Westerners. Some challenge from Islam as well. We want to, like we have gained from interaction with other cultures, produce material that we can share with colleagues in Africa. The greatest victims of superstition are today in Africa, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan. There's so much to learn from each other, share the information. So much to do with our colleagues from the West. So university is one idea, online. And we also want to create audiovisual material, a channel uh, to create it. People are not reading anymore. Um, we need to package information, challenge ideas that way. We want to offer non-religious ceremonies to people. We want to say, you want to get married? This is a method of getting married without God, without religion, celebrating life. I can tell you in Bay Area, I was explaining this thing, and one of the people there, he said, it's the same woman, but I want to marry her again. Will you perform my wedding humanist way? Because my wedding, I was so deeply unhappy. They didn't let me eat anything. They made me sit down. They didn't let me talk to my wife. And we were sitting and somebody was washing feet. And there was some mantra being read, which I didn't understand. I want to do a humanist wedding. Will you do it for me? It'll be soon 25 years. There are human needs. And secular people also have them. A baby naming ceremony. And South Asian communities have a lot of wife beating. Who can deny that? Women are abused in the South Asian communities. We want to offer counseling services. Human rights abuse cannot be allowed. They will not come out. We want to offer that as well. We want to create exchange programs with South Asia and here so that people get to understand how things are. So there's a huge uh, plan that we are scheming and then on depending on the resources available, we want to link up with the United Nations. All those people being killed in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Burma, Afghanistan, somebody has to speak for them. Nobody will speak for them. Google has stopped talking about free speech 
after they got business opportunity in China. Same thing is happening with India. Who is talking about what's happening in India? No one. Because growth rate here is one and a half percent, one percent, banks are giving negative interest, and there is eight percent growth opportunity in South Asia. Nobody will speak about freedoms. So we want to be there at the UN, talk about this, and raise a defense for the interests of uh, humanists, and to defend a great aspect of human civilization. South Asia's contribution to human civilization is not small. That it was colonized is just a part. There is so much more it has offered. So we want to work on these things. That's the grand scheme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had a period of our history in the evolution of uh, Western um, thinking and uh, uh, knowledge, uh, termed the Enlightenment, that spanned the period in, primarily in the 16th and 17th centuries uh, into the 18th. Um, and uh, it um, gave, gave rise to uh, a lot of the cultural trends that have continued uh, uh, the, the, the peak of it was referred to as the age of reason. And I, I can't help thinking that many of the people involved in that uh, movement at that time would be immensely disappointed at how we've slid backward in many ways in uh, Western culture and <laughs> seemingly just fell off a cliff <laughs> within the last year or so. But. <laughs> It's maybe not as bad as all that. Maybe that'll prompt things to turn around a little bit. But uh, what interests me is that with the legacy that that period has left, it's left uh, 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 sort of a, by momentum a lot of uh, capabilities within Western culture to continue to develop new thoughts, ideas. Now, a lot of the anecdotes that you told, uh, the stories of superstition uh, ruling and irrationality ruling people's uh, lives were stories of, of common people and, and less educated people. You did mention that uh, there are some educated people who are not immune from it. But I'm wondering if in your travels in I, I've been to India uh, twice uh, but I did not didn't spend enough time there to really uh, get a strong feeling for the country but I'm interested in knowing do you feel that there's a, a difference in the upper level people as well as it, 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 the more educated people as far as their capacity for uh, critical thinking for rational thinking uh, creativity because it seems like there would be a trickle-down effect that would be very important and rather than just trying to stamp out superstition in the local villages uh, what's it like in Hyderabad in general I mean what are you encountering there thank you, thank you. Um, I Can you yeah, I think in the answer you will see what uh, I'm responding to. Um, I must appreciate it that you have considered the Dalai Lama amongst the uneducated ones. That is a good recognition of his abilities, but more seriously. Um, sadly, a trickle-down effect is always trickle-down, and we all know that including economics, it never trickles down. Having said that, the ones at the topmost echelons of society are the ones more strongly wedded to superstition than anyone else. Everything that I have said to you could have been curtailed by the law or by steps taken by the government because they are not about just belief, they are about deceit. They are about violence against people's rights and human dignity. But the rulers are participating in it rather than doing anything about it. Um, you will be surprised by the counterintuitive information that the rise of wealth in India has led to increased numbers of temples because you have to be grateful to God for the new riches you are seeing. 
the confusion of culture and religion leads you to become more ritualistic and even that has been happening and today of course the sponsors of this are the rulers which makes it even more problematic um, Indian scientists have done brilliant things um, the rover to Mars was of course a special thing and it had special things to do India sent a Mars observer uh, and managed to launch it without even the first failure that has been the story of every country that tried. And at one-tenth the cost of what the Mars rover uh, trial cost. But they did it before, um, they did it only after praying to the gods in the temple. They took a model of uh, the satellite and the rocket launcher. They put it, offered it to the gods, the model, and prayed and sought its blessings. My challenge to all of them has been on TV and elsewhere, it's good to have that belief. So don't load that rocket fuel. And now hope to let it go up. Now don't do all the rocket fuel and look for the, uh, the, the right time, the correct window when to launch, do the countdown and also pray to God. Um, there are serious problems with the educated people in India, sadly. Uh, most of the good educated people, I'm not certainly saying we are all brilliant and intelligent, but of the best of the lot are somewhere here. The best of Indians are leaving the country and they come here with their caste system. They come with their discrimination. I am aware of how racist Indians are back home and here. I challenge any Indian to refer to a colored man, a black man, with some respect. Oh, Kali Arai. Yeah, the black fellow is coming. It's the common term used by the Indian. If they can't treat their fellow Indian equal, why would they do to someone who doesn't even look Indian? So, sadly, the people you would meet are people who speak English. That's about 3% of India. And they're all speaking to each other, saying to each other how great our country is and what a fantastic society we have. But the rest who don't speak the international language are the ones I would like to reach out to. I have chosen, my English is okay, my French too and German as well. Uh, but I have chosen my mother tongue and sometimes Hindi as a means of reaching out to fellow Indians because that's what they're all watching. Nobody's watching English TV, believe me. Nobody does things outside their mother tongue. And we are talking 90 million Telugu speaking people. We are speaking tens of millions of people speaking their own language. The Renaissance, the age of reason, has to be, the enlightenment has to come through local language. <coughs> so, the elite, I'm not impressed. <laughs> All right, with that, uh, we would like to close the question and answer session because our guest has to catch a flight. I would like to thank each and every one of you for coming. And also, I would now like to turn it over to Raghu to give a word of thanks. If anyone is interested, join us, humanism.asia. All this could not be possible with, without the help of a um, lot of folks, so it's, it's important to thank them. And um, thank you for coming, uh, uh, Babu Goginini, uh, sir, and uh, Vishal Merchant for doing an awesome job of uh, emceeing. Sanjay Ghakar, I guess he made sure uh, Babu came to this uh, spot safe and sound, so got to... Then the Houston Community College Dean, uh, Mr. Arik, I guess it should be Dr. Arik uh, Nitzberg for the facilitating this auditorium. And the Houston Community College Office Manager, uh, Ms. Christina Dominguez. And uh, 
uh, Ravi, Dr. Ravi Brahmabhat, Director of Student Innovation and Entrepreneurship uh, for the, in the Houston Community College. Uh, and uh, our photograph, uh, for the photography services, uh, Mr. Mohammad Almani. Uh, volunteers, uh, Mr. Sivara Maripalli. Kulwan Singh Bhatia, who could not be here. He had some prior commitments. Uh, Guru Siddhappa and uh, Mihika Basu. I met her today after a long time. Nice to have you helping us. Uh, Mike Arya and uh, Mrs. Lakshmi Vavilala. I guess uh, we need our support in the, uh, the, in the family level. Uh, supporting organizations, South Asian Humanist Association and Humanists of Houston, we appreciate your uh, active participation, uh, being there. It's, it's all, a, we all have to learn a lot of things and we have to keep learning every day. So it's good that you could participate and uh, be in touch. Thank you for coming, Babu. Thank you. Thank you.